My name is Tele Kuusk. I'm Euronco Kidney Cancer Platform uh, co-editor. And today I'm very delighted to welcome Professor Piero Razio, who is a euro-oncologist uh, from Penn University and Medical Center from Pennsylvania, and Professor Siva, who is a radiation oncologist uh, from Peter McCullen Sa Cancer Center from Melbourne. Thank you very much for joining. Thanks for having us. Yeah, excited to be here. And today we are going to discuss about uh, kidney cancer and specifically about small renal mass management. And um, as we know, uh, there has been during last year's introduction of uh, stereotactic radiotherapy into care for primary kidney cancer. And uh, I would love to uh, have some uh, your opinion and views on, on that. So, Professor uh, Siva, you recently published a phase two trial on uh, SPRT for primary kidney cancer up to 10 centimeter. Uh, would you uh, share the findings? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, thank you. The, the study that we just published uh, in Lancet Oncology in March of this year uh, was called uh, the trans Tasman Radiation Oncology Group Fast Track 2 trial. So this is the first multi-centre trial for um, uh, a non-operative intervention in primary kidney cancer. And we enrolled patients who had biopsy-confirmed kidney cancer um, of any type, clear cell, papillary, uh, and these patients had tumours of up to 10 centimetres in size with a minimum EGFR of uh, 30 mils per minute. So in other words, patients with a chronic kidney disease class 3 or above. Um, these patients underwent stereotactic radiotherapy, which was either a single fraction of 26 gray for patients who had T1A tumors, a smaller than four centimeters. And for those patients who had larger tumors uh, of T1B or higher, um, then up to 10 centimeters, um, we had three fractions of 14 gray or a total dose of 42 gray. Um, the median follow-up in this study was 43 months. Uh, and the headline figures we looked at, the primary outcome measure was local control. Uh, and we had, throughout the lifetime of the trial, 100% uh, local control, so no patient had a recurrence of their primary kidney tumour. Um, in, the, in the sense of uh, cancer-specific survival, also there were no cancer-related deaths from the patients who were enrolled into this trial. Um, so there's 100% cancer-specific survival at, at um, the entire timeline of the trial. From an EGFR perspective, it was pretty um, uh, expect, uh, expected for the group. The baseline chronic kidney disease uh, was, was high in this cohort, so the average EGFR is 59 mils per minute. But, but despite that, we saw a loss of EGFR of 14 mils per minute in the total cohort. Um, so overall, the, the findings were quite exciting. Um, and I think it fit a very clear cohort. Those patients who were medically inoperable are those that were technically high risk, for example, the risk of dialysis post-surgery. Uh, then these patients now have a new standard option uh, for them in, in, in SBRT or SABRE. Mm. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> and uh, you chose local uh, control as your primary endpoint. And uh, would you mind saying how do you assess uh, recurrence and local control? And uh, are you afraid of any misdiagnosis of recurrences? So this, we used uh, a standardised reporting criteria, which is RESIS 1.1. Uh, which is a radiological assessment of tumour size. Uh, and so the, um, over time, with the median follow-up of 43 months, we watched these tumours shrink over time. Uh, and the measurement criteria for local control was any patient that had a progression of their tumour during this period of time, so enlarging uh, um, primary kidney cancer. So there are issues with potential misdiagnosis of recurrence. So one thing is that contrast enhancement, which is something that we use for thermal ablation to assess success, is not relevant in the context of radiotherapy. When you think about these two treatment modalities, thermal ablation is something that's physically destructive. It's superheating, cauterizing the, uh, the arter arterial vessels or freezing and, and crystalline ice ball formation around uh, the tumor. And this physically disrupts the, the vasculature. Radiotherapy doesn't do that in the short term. It happens over a longer period of time. So post-treatment contrast enhancement is common after SABRE and it's expected. And in fact, there are studies from our institution and others that have shown immediately post-treatment we see hyper-intensity or hyper-enhancement uh, after radiation. 
We expect to see this degrade over time, so over years this will continue to, to reduce in, in size, but you can misdiagnose if you do too early if you, if you rely on contrast enhancement. The other thing to consider also is if you image too early, so within say three months of uh, radiotherapy uh, and particularly bladed radiation, you can see pseudo progression, so post inflammatory effects that look like the tumour might be slightly bigger before it then starts to progress over many, many years. Um, so there is a potential of, of misdiagnosis of, uh, of recurrence and it's important to observe this over time. The longer you can keep watching and seeing these tumour tumours regress, you have uh, a bit of a standardised pattern of what to expect. And um, how do you counsel your patients currently about long-term uh, toxicity such as secondary malignancy or also kidney uh, function decay? So it's important to recognise that the patients that we're treating at present and enrolment on the trial, with those patients who were older, who had more comorbidities, who had um, uh, who were not uh, surgical candidates up front, um, but may have other uh, issues, but the cancer was significant. So 70% of the patients had failed on initial active surveillance and the tumours were growing. These are all 100% biopsy confirmed. And two thirds of the patients had T1V tumours or larger. We had T2, we had one patient with node positive disease as well. All of them treated on the trial. Um, so when we're counselling these patients, secondary malignancy risk is not something I counsel them about yet. I think if we were treating very young patients in their 40s, for example, this may be something to consider, but we're not, I'm not doing that on a routine basis. Um, and in terms of other complication risks, there's a medium term complication risk of chest wall pain or uh, flank pain. That's about 10%. Usually this is self-resolving or resolving with a short course of steroids. There's an up to 5% risk, it's probably 1% to 3% risk of uh, stricture from in the bowel from radiotherapy too. And then we talk about renal function decline. And on average, the patients that we're seeing, we're, t we're seeing about an average between 10 and 15 mils of GFR decline at two years. And then this plateaus off and becomes the same kind of rate as coronary kidney disease beyond that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you think that also size of the tumour matters um, regarding the toxicity? It does, and I think it's more a geographical uh, distribution of the size of the tumour in relation to the other organs at risk that are close by. So for example, a smaller tumour that's contacting the small bowel is more risky than a larger tumour that might be exophytic, posterior located in the flank that should be relatively easy to treat. Um, now the renal pelvis for us is not an issue, which is an issue for thermal ablation because the renal pe pelvis can act as a heat sink drawing away energy, thermal energy, or uh, uretric stricture can be an issue, which is not an issue for, for SAVA. Um, so size is a criteria, but I think it's more the shape and where the tumour is that defines how uh, um, safe it's going to be. And if we're trying to uh, reduce the dose on some of these organs at risk, try to be able to make it a bit more safer for very large tumours, then we should probably expect maybe the efficacy won't be as high as we see on this trial. And uh, so would you currently recommend already SPRT as one option uh, for treatment? Um, I think so, yes. And it is guideline recommended already in NCCN. There is a weak recommendation in the EAU guidelines at present, which I think should be upgraded. And we do use, uh, use it routinely in our practice that outside of a trial. I think it's important to note that um, there's not that much prospective data for thermal ablation. In fact, there are no prospective clinical trials for thermal ablation as yet. We have over a dozen trials in SABRE, and this is the first multi-centre phase two international trial. Um, so the evidence base is relatively robust, and I think the optimal patient group is, you know, maybe the group that's not such a small renal mass, but borderline and more challenging from a, from a uh, thermal ablation or a surgical approach. Mm, thanks. Uh, Professor Piero Razio, uh, you are a uh, uro-oncologist and active uh, in active surveillance uh, studies and trials. Uh, would you elaborate uh, a bit, uh, what is active surveillance currently utilised properly and uh, what are your recommendations? Yeah, so we start every conversation now uh, with active surveillance as the first option for most patients with at least small renal masses and most patients with kidney tumors in general, just to kind of start our conversation with the most conservative therapy. We now have 
15 years of data in our prospective study, probably two decades worth of really nice prospective data from around the world showing that active surveillance or serial imaging of small renal masses, these are the clinical T1A tumors that are suspicious for renal cell carcinoma, is really a safe option for most patients, um, even young healthy patients as a initial management strategy. And what we know is the rates of metastatic progression are incredibly low. It's less than 1% for tumors in the two to three centimeter range or smaller. It gets up to about one or 2% as you approach four centimeters and starts climbing after that. But we know with serial follow-up, close imaging, all of these patients will be caught and treated before metastatic disease develops. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is your protocol for active surveillance currently and modality, how, it, how you do it? Yeah, currently we recommend imaging every six months for the first two years. And we know if we see stability over the first two years, it becomes slightly less likely that tumor is going to grow. So then we'll move to annual imaging for most patients after two years. We do require axial imaging up front. So if a patient's diagnosed with an ultrasound, we do want to see either a CT scan or an MRI to give us better characterization of the mass. That doesn't need to happen immediately, particularly if it's an older person or someone who has comorbidities and that mass is sub two centimeters. We know there's no rush to get them in the CT scanner or MRI, so we might make their first image axial. And we typically alternate ultrasounds and CT scan and MRI for measurement of these masses. Our main trigger for intervention is tumor size and as a corollary, tumor growth. And if you know where a tumor is and your ultrasound technologists know where they're looking, ultrasound's actually a wonderful modality for looking at these masses. It's got good measurement uh, characteristics. It's, e it's relatively easy to find the the mass in most patients, not all patients, but most patients. And so we typically alternate ultrasound and axial imaging for patients in active surveillance. Mm. And in the light of SPRT uh, now, uh, what, uh, what, is, what would be your management plan after recurrence of SPRT, you as urologist and active surgeon as well? Yeah, first I just want to congratulate Dr. Steven and his colleagues. I mean, this is phenomenal work. And I think these are really correlative studies and correlative data, right? We, uh, we know it's safe to watch the clinical T1A renal mass, but where we don't know is safe is where we start pushing that T1B boundary. Once we start crossing over four centimeters, we know once we get into the T2 range, the rates of metastatic disease become exceedingly high. Upward range of 20, 25% of those tumors are gonna be high grade, high stage tumors. But in the T1B range, we don't know. And I will say honestly, probably most of those patients don't need treatment but we don't know how to select those patients and find them. And when we become, when we have a now non-operative management strategy that is really effective at controlling those tumors and offering those patients a durable management strategy, I think that's correlative to active surveillance that helps us keep patients out of the operating room, avoid the toxicities of major surgery, and give us credit when we need to go to the operating room that we're actually operating on patients who truly need a surgery for kidney cancer. And uh, would you be confident to uh, do surgery after SBRT? Yeah, uh, we've done it. Um, you know, SBRT, we're, we're using it exactly in the patients they put on their trial. These are typically patients with larger tumors where we know percutaneous cryoablation or, or radiofrequency ablation is not really a good modality just because of tumor size. We know the efficacy rates drop. And so we're, we've been using stereotactic radiation based on your earlier data um, for a number of years in patients with four, five, six centimeter tumors who really can't go to the operating room. And anecdotally, we've seen excellent results with it. Um, I've had, to be honest, only one patient that we've had to take to the operating room. And surgery wasn't fun, but it wasn't as tough as doing a post-cryotherapy surgery either uh, in that setting. Cryotherapy tends to affect kind of the region, uh, the kidney more regionally. And so you'll see a lot of inflammation in the perinephric fat and in the entire tract of where that probe went in with with uh, stereotactic radiation, you really are seeing dense scar in the kidney tumor and maybe some surrounding kidney there, but it's a little more localized to where the treatment effect is. And uh, would you offer um, active surveillance also for, for the trial patients of, of fast track? Or? Yeah, well, I think, I think we are pretty set on offering active surveillance for things less than four centimeters. We've started pushing the boundaries, once again, in a prospective protocolized manner for patients with T1B tumors, but not all of those patients are willing to accept those risks. And for the patients who aren't willing to accept the risks of, of surveillance, 
which is a low but quantifiable rate of metastatic disease, stereotactic radiation is a great option for them. It's, as you said, often one treatment, uh, one treatment period, at most three at our center. And so it's really easy on these patients. There's no general anesthesia. They're going home the same day, and they really have minimal toxicity related to it. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Pierazio and Siva, uh, to join us and have a great meeting. Thanks. Thank Pleasure you. being here.